good morning. <laughs> All right. This is my test of how to quiet a class down, correct? <laughs> Anyways, good morning. This is a wonderful turnout. Um, it's great to see everybody here on Flex Day. For those of you who don't know who I am, I am uh, Anne Marie Gable. I'm your acting superintendent president. So it's uh, my honor to be here today. Uh, when Jerry sent me the email and asked if I would do the welcome, I just said, of course, I would love to do the welcome. Um, this is a very important day. Jerry has, again, gone above and beyond and planned a very uh, impactful day, hopefully, a very full day with, um, it looks like, a lot of great sessions. So hopefully you guys will all enjoy it. You know, I just kind of wanted to start off by saying thank you for being here. Thank you for everything that you guys do for our students. Um, as we know, our student success is a result of what you guys do day in and day out in the classroom, and our students wouldn't be able to succeed without you. So thank you very much for, for what you do um, daily. And, and you know, that, that really, I really am sincere. Hopefully you're not thinking, oh, she's just saying that because that's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> I really do believe that, <laughs> yes, Rico said, I know you guys too well. Um, <laughs> but uh, you guys really do make our students succeed. And your job is so, so important for our students in order for them to meet their goals and to move on in life for whatever it is that they want to do. So thank you very much. I'm not gonna take a whole lot of time on, on welcoming. Um, you know, I will say that we have a lot of activities going on this uh, semester. And I, I know how much time it takes and how much work everything is. But in the end, it all works out. You know, we have our strategic plan that was developed. We are implementing that strategic plan. You'll hear all about the guided pathways. We have hired a, not hired, we have reassigned a full-time faculty member to be our guided pathways coordinator, Kim Anderson. So if she hasn't come to your department and told you how much you, um, or how much she wants to work with you, <laughs> then you can expect her to come to you shortly because I know she is going to visit everyone <laughs> to, uh, to help everyone learn what we're doing, why we're doing it, and where we want to go. Um, so it's kind of an exciting time to do this. So I will go ahead and kick us off. You know, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Estella Ben-Simon. She is here with us today. She is going to be our first speaker. And a little bit about her. She's a professor of higher education at the USC Rossier School of Education and she's the director for the Center of Urban Education, which she founded in 1999. So the, the Center for Urban Education, or Q, has a singular focus on increasing equity in higher education outcomes for students of color. She also developed the Equity Scorecard. And the Equity Scorecard is a process for using inquiry to drive changes in institutional practice and culture. The innovative scorecard process takes a strength-based approach, starting from the premise that faculty and administrators are committed to doing the good. The other goal is of not just marginal changes in policy and practice, but to shift the campus towards a culture of inclusion and broad ownership over racial equality. Um, so that's a very lofty goal, but we're gonna be getting there. You know, Dr. Ben Simone has published extensively about equity, 
organizational learning, practitioner inquiry, and change. She has held the highest leadership positions in the Association for the Study of Higher Education and in the American Education Research Association. And Dr. Ben Simone was Associate Dean of the USC Rosier School of Education from 96 through 2000 and was a Fulbright Scholar to Mexico in 2002. And she just got back from a six month sabbatical in Mexico, so we need to be nice to her. She's kind of easing back into uh, <laughs> doing uh, this work, although she never gave up her her duties with Q, even while she was in Mexico, but uh, she is recently back from there. So help me welcome Dr. Ben Simone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you, President Gable. And uh, I also want to acknowledge um, Shauna Haggerty and uh, Karen Rothstein, who we have been working with, uh, Dr. Terry Long. And uh, I also want to introduce some of my colleagues from the Center for Urban Education. I should tell you that this is my first public uh, presentation since coming back three weeks ago from Mexico City. And my biggest worry was, would I still remember how to do it? Um, so um, this is a good test. Um, I want to introduce first uh, Jordan Greer, uh, sitting right here. And um, uh, Jordan is a project specialist with the Center for Urban Education. And the reason why she's here, I don't know how many of you know, that our center is working with Long Beach City College, probably, I, I believe, for the next two years. So Jordan is one of the project specialists that is, um, that is assigned to Long Beach. And I also want to uh, introduce Dr. Rebecca Cox, sitting right over here. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, Becky uh, is actually a professor at Simon Fraser University in Canada, and some of you may have heard of her because she is the author of The College Fear Factor, a very well-known book that is based on her um, fieldwork, her, her observations of community college classrooms. And, uh, and was published a couple of years ago by the Harvard University Press. She's here with us for six months and actually had a chance to come here a couple of days ago to meet with the uh, team of faculty members that Matt Lawrence from the philosophy department has convened to work um, on, on inquiry. So I think that um, I'm also, of course, honored to be here in the company of my friends, Frank Harris, Luke Wood over here, and also Dr. Veronica Neal from Foothill De Anza. And, uh, and of course, I'm also very pleased to be back at Long Beach City College. I don't know how many of you are here that remember me from when I first worked with Long Beach City and their, um, when Eloy was, uh, for, when he first became president. So um, let me start out with the title of my, of my talk. Um, the, the title is, This is Not the Time to Stop Talking About Race. And the reason why I, I chose this title is because often in the work that we do at the Center for Urban Education, we are asked, you know, why do you focus just on equity in regards to race and ethnicity. Why don't you also look at other kinds of identities that might result in marginalization, like for instance, socioeconomic status? So here are some of the reasons why we focus on race. First of all, uh, it's very hard to escape being African American and often being Latino. It's, it's visible. We, we can see, uh, for instance, former President Obama, and he is, regardless of whatever, he's still, he's still African-American, he's black. 
Um, the other reason is that um, many of the groups that we work with, African Americans, Mexican Americans, Puerto Ricans, and other indigenous communities, they have actually been a subject to legalized exclusion. There have been laws in this country that actually excluded them from their participation in our educational institutions, housing, you know, think about the Jim Crow laws that, uh, that had separate, but you know, supposedly equal, it's, it actually was separate and unequal. Um, the, for Mexican Americans, the prohibition against the use of Spanish in, in, the, in the schools. There is a famous uh, Menendez case here in, in California, which was about the segregation of uh, Mexican American students. And, and, and also because the relationship between African Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Mexican Americans with the United States came as a result of enslavement, it came as a result of the you know, invasion of territory, um, Mexico, uh, Puerto Rico colonization. So for all of those reasons, racial and ethnic identity is in itself a, an identity that has come primarily from marginalization and minoritization, which is different from uh, disadvantage based on income, for instance. The other reason is that, you know, we have financial aid policies that assist, you know, that, that exist to remove the barriers to admissions for low income students, although I admit that those financial aid programs are, 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 um, are sort of diminishing and, uh, and that there is still a lot of inequality based on income, but nevertheless, we do have safeguards for uh, low socioeconomic income and where we have actually eliminated the affirmative action, which was in a way a form of reparations for the, this past discrimination for African Americans and later also for, uh, for other groups, including women. We pretty much have done away with that. And uh, the other reason is that many advocate for let's do away with, and as we have, affirmative action based on race, and why don't we use socioeconomic status as the criterion for, uh, for, for admitting students into higher education. The, um, and, and the reason why we do not necessarily support that is because even though African Americans and, and Mexican Americans and other Latino groups and also Native Americans may be more concentrated in the lower socioeconomic status, they're still fewer than white students. So affirmative action based on socioeconomic status would actually have a greater benefit for white students. And then finally, because if we don't focus on race, we are obstructing the democratic purposes of education. Regardless of what is happening around us today in the political environment, we are a very diverse country. And in order for us to uh, be able to, to continue being um, a country that others want to come to, we have to be responsive to the racial issues that still affect us. So those are some of the reasons. Another reason is, for us here in California, I mean, we are the outlier in many ways. Um, look at the population change in California between 1960 and uh, uh, 2012. The, the number of people have doubled. But look what has happened in terms of um, the, um, the white population was 83%, it went down by more than half, and look at the Latino population, 9% in 1960, 38%. So for African Americans, he has stayed, well, he actually has, um, yeah, it has, it has stayed pretty much uh, steady. But so because of this, because of the kind of state that we're in, we cannot ignore race. 
So, so why is it um, so difficult to talk about race? Um, it's because, and one of the reasons is because it, it causes conflicts. Um, people feel guilty. People feel defensive. Why are we talking about race again? All of those kinds of things. And what I'm here to say to you is that we have to develop an ease to talk about race and to recognize that there are racialized experiences in our institutions of higher education. One of the, um, one of the reasons is that, that, that we don't always talk about race is because we still continue to think that racial discrimination is individual and overt, right? That, you know, we, I'm not a racist in the, in the, in the, in the historical way of, and, but actually racism in, uh, is manifested through our structures. And what I'm hoping that I will leave you with today is to understand how uh, racial disadvantage is caused by the things that we do routinely every day. And I hope to give you examples of that. Because we all do it, and we do it often without realizing it. And that's what I think we as higher education practitioners need to learn. We need to learn how to be able to see structural racism when it is being enacted in front of our own eyes. Um, let me just give you an example, just to make, put this into context. I was at Trinidad Junior College on Friday in Colorado. And they are one of the equity scorecard colleges. And as part of our work, our teams of faculty and administrators, they use a protocol that we have created to study their own documents. They're you know, like, kind of like qualitative researchers or anthropologists, but studying language. And one of the things that they studied was their website. And, and, and following our protocol, one of the things that they look for is who is represented in this website. And they found that there was only in the entire website one African American. And that that one African American represented in the, um, in, in the website was actually somebody who was graduating from a program that they had just started for the formerly incarcerated. Now, it was great that they have that program, right? It was also great that this man graduated from, but it was problematic that that was the only representation of an African American male because it, um, it, it, it sort of reinforces stereotypes, and, and we don't want to do that. And so our team understood that because they learned it through the protocol. It was great. I mean, they were able to call that out. But the person from marketing who is in charge of the website came in into our meeting, and it was really difficult for him to understand why, what the problem was. And he, we had a long discussion with him, and finally, you know, I think he got it. But that's what I mean by structural racism. It's what we create through things that we are not aware of, and it's based on knowledge. So um, often, you know, the, the whole issue around race is that it gets conflated with affirmative action or things like in this state we're not supposed to talk about race and so on. And I'll show you what I mean by, we just did um, a, a webinar for the uh, Association of American Colleges and Universities. And as part of the webinar, we did a poll while we were doing the, uh, the webinar. And we, uh, this was one of the questions, fear of conflict is an obstacle to, the, obstacle to discussing and addressing racial and ethnic inequity. And if you look at the results, between strongly agree and agree, 52% of our respondents agreed 
that fear of conflict. We are conflict adverse, and so we need to learn how to talk about these issues uh, in a way that um, both that we can manage the conflict and also not let the conflict discourage us from having conversations that we have to. And one of the ways of doing that is with evidence. And like the, what I just mentioned to you about the website, you know, that's a form of evidence. So, okay, let me talk about now what is equity and what is equity in terms of racial equity. So, um, and I, I want to differentiate the term equity from equality and from diversity. So equality imagines an equal world, right? I care about all students equally. We hear this a lot of times in our work. I don't see, you know, I don't see race, I don't see gender. All students matter, right? Instead of black lives matter, all lives matter. So that's what equality is about. And everybody has the same size uh, staircase or ladder and up to get up to their diploma. So that's, that's the concept of equality. Now, but the problem is that the world and our educational system is not equal. So some students, because of where they live in particular, I mean, where you live matters a great deal. They have access to, I see, does this, okay. They have access to scholarships. You know, they have tutors for the SATs. You know, they're middle to upper class. They get honors courses. AP credit, you know, highly skilled teachers, and they have active social networks and social capital. All of those things mean that they are much more advantaged, so that their ladder up to the diploma is a little shorter. And, um, and that's something that we need, that's really important to understand. So take California, for instance, the A through G requirements. I don't, are you familiar with what they are? They are the courses in high school that you take that make you qualify to enter the Cal State or the UC system. Well, there is a major disparity on access to the A through G curriculum depending on where you go to school. And that is the case for Latinos and African Americans. And, and you see, where you live is not always, where, particularly for Mexican Americans, Latinos and blacks, where they live often is the result of segregation and redlining practices. And um, there's a wonderful article on this in The Atlantic, uh, The Case for Reparations by Tenehisi Coates, and uh, which I highly recommend it because he very methodically documents how housing, the, the housing market in essentially created the inequalities that we experience today. So for students who come, this was done by one of our projects, this, this whole thing was done by one of our project specialists, it's very creative. But if you notice, um, The, um, the person is coming from under, underground almost, right? And, uh, and, you know, has gone to poorly funded schools, less skilled teachers, counselor ratios of one to 1,000. So that's why equality is not always possible. So the other aspect of all of this is that the system has bias and systemic racism. So students who come from those backgrounds often experience, you know, microaggressions, implicit bias, so like microaggressions. The issue of the, the, um, the picture on the website of only one African American who was formerly incarcerated, that's a form of microaggression because it, it, in a way, it paints a whole population. Um, implicit bias. By implicit bias, I mean the expectations that we as faculty often, often make, and we all do that. I did it when I teach graduate students, and I remember to this day 
teaching a course at Penn State University, which was where I first taught, and having a student who was a football player. And I immediately made stereotypical assumptions, wondering, this was a course on, on feminist theory. <laughs> 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 and I'm wondering, what, what is he doing here? And he looked, and he looked totally bored and disengaged, and I, in turn, also ignored him because of my stereotypes and because of the way that he was behaving. I could cry now when I think about the last day when he came to see me in my office and confessed to me that he was incredibly shy and that he was fearful, fearful, Becky, <laughs> of participating. And that taught me a very, very important lesson. So we all do this. So I also want to say something about diversity, because often we confound equity with diversity. And uh, diversity is about the representation of people, but when we're talking about increasing diversity, often we're talking about increasing diversity into a broken, broken ladder. So diversity by itself is not going to resolve our problems of inequity. So what does equity mean? It means that you, know, you redirect resources to the pathways with the greatest need to be fixed. And so the kinds of fixes for equity that, you know, and these are not all of them, but is regular data disaggregation and analysis. Not to show that Latinos and African Americans do less well, but in order to identify where there are gaps that you, you know, that you want to address. And you're doing that in part in the student equity plan. But I want to underscore that it's not enough to do it in the student equity plan. You also have to do it in your strategic plan. You also have to do it in your academic pathways data and everything that, uh, that has to do with students and data as well as with faculty. Um, goal setting and action planning. I don't mean just goals. What I mean is unless we set goals for closing the gaps by group, it's very hard to really make progress. We all have goals, right? We need to have goals for what proportion of, let's say, Latinos who started at Long Beach City College in the fall of 2016 will transfer within the next five years. Unless we do that, it's really hard to know how we're doing. Um, faculty and staff training to be equity facilitators. This is actually some, comes from our work that we just completed with Cal, Cal Lutheran University. They wanted to diversify their faculty. I know you're also doing a lot of hiring. We trained the provost <clears throat> and a team of 30 faculty members to become the equity advocates within faculty search committees. We trained them how to rewrite uh, faculty job announcements, how to Re change the way that they do their interviews in order to avoid implicit bias. And they're being now spread across all of the searches of Cal Lutheran in order to be able to teach the search committees what they learned with us. Uh, the results of their searches are quite amazing. Uh, <clears throat> and then the last thing is using inquiry to understand how practices impede equity. Now, everybody uses the term inquiry nowadays. In 1999, it was hardly ever used, but now it's like the trending term. And, uh, but inquiry is a very complex process. It's not, the, the word may seem um, self-evident, but how you do inquiry takes a lot of effort and structures and tools, and that's what we at Q provide. Um, okay, so what does it mean to measure equity? So one of the ways in which you can measure equity, and this, I'm just giving you examples to, 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 to make the concept clear. So I'm gonna look at the Latino population. So let's, in 2014-15, 46% of California's uh, high school graduates were Latino. And so equity for, in our definition would be 
that 46 percent of the students who came to a community to community colleges, all of the 113, to the CSU and to the UCs would also be 46 percent. That's not the way it is, but that's the way proportional equity would be that. Uh, another way of measuring equity is to look at interim measures. So take here at Long Beach City College. You could look at equity in terms of who persists to the next academic year, to the next semester, who completes 24 credits within two academic years, completes a degree or transfers within 150%, within three years. So those are more granular measures of, of equity. And, and also, not only collected data, so okay, so one thing is that I bet that you do collect this data. The issue is not just collecting it, it's how you report it and to whom it is reported. And then lastly, you know, one of the things is that when we talk about um, minority students, or students of color, we often talk about them only in survival terms, in terms of meeting the basics. And it's also important to look at the representation in STEM majors, research opportunities when there is research with faculty, you know, and their participation in high demand fields. So it's important to look at where your students are concentrated in which, in which fields, because that also is an aspect of equity. So I see that it is quarter to 10 already, and I am curious as to what time I should finish. Uh, <laughs> uh, what time should I finish? <laughs> okay. So I'm gonna go quickly here. I was going to actually, I had an activity also, but I'm gonna skip it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, so uh, let's go on then. How do we typically understand the problem of racial ethnic inequity? So often when we go to campuses and we look at data, that show, for instance, you know, uh, lower performance among uh, black and, and Latino students in math or in, in other areas, low transfer rates. We often get comments that uh, actually put the onus for those low performance on the students. You know, they're underprepared, they're not motivated, they don't know how to study, they don't know how to be students. They don't have good work habits. They never come to see me during office hours. You know, school is not a priority. I'm sure you've heard some of this. And you know what? We say these things not because we are bad people, but because all of our theories of student success are based on how much effort the student puts. Our theories of student success are not based on how much effort is put by the faculty member, and that's why when students are not doing well, we tend to look at their characteristics rather than ask, you know, how, what is it that I'm doing, in, you know, that the way that I teach seems to work for these students, but not for these students. So that's one way. Another one we have heard is, you know, we have a math resource center. The students don't take advantage of it. I, I, have you heard that? You know? <laughs> so, um, or, you know, they don't realize that college is different from high school. So these are all real things that we hear on, on college campuses. And this last one is actually one of our equity scorecard teams where um, they were looking at the total college enrollment, which is the pie chart on the left, and the, num and the percentage of students who transfer to, um, to the flagship university. And essentially what this, this shows is that their enrollment was 40% Latino and that the, their transfers that particular year was 20% Latino. And so there was a big disparity. Now you might say, well, you can't compare enrollment with transfer, you know, that's a really crude measure, which is true, it's kind of crude, you know, or you might think 
I, but you might think all of the things that these people said, okay, counselor, this may be an issue for Latino students because of pressure from family to stay close to home. In other words, they don't go to the more selective university because they want to stay at home. Whenever I hear that, I always say they go to the army. Um, and uh, <laughs> so the, and the dean says, uh, you know, more black and Latino students may transfer to the local four-year college than to the state's leading university because the state college is closer to home. So these are all hunches that they, these individuals have, but that tend to rationalize why this data look like they do. And that's an empirical question. You know, why are they not transferring? And in fact, we did that study here at Long Beach City College several years ago. It was called the Missing 87. I don't know if there's anybody from that group uh, here today, but it was, oh, you, you <laughs> French. Yes. <laughs> So we, well, we looked at students who qualified to transfer to the UC system and looked into why they had not transferred. If you're interested in that, we actually published an article in the Harvard Education Review on that, on that project. Um, okay. Oops, did I do that? Okay. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that we typically think of student success as the sum of student commitment and student effort. And that's what we have been taught. We have been taught that by all of this psychological, social psychology theories on student success. And what I'm saying is, you know, why can't we think about student success as the sum of institutional commitment and practitioner effort. And our work goes into building that practitioner effort. So what, our, what, I, what I've been saying essentially is that our traditional student success frameworks uh, equate inequ inequitable outcomes with the student's characteristics, behaviors, often even their culture. And uh, what, what we think needs to happen is that in order to have equity, we need to change, we need to change and or look into and change structures, cultures, practices, and routines. And so how do we do that? We came up with the concept of equity-mindedness. And the reason why that looks like a brain is because what the, the deficit perspective that we have on students is learned knowledge. We have learned that. It's knowledge that we have below consciousness and that we just, we, 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 we take out of our brain when we see things and without even thinking about it. And uh, so we need to change this mental schema that we have to what we call equity-mindedness. And some of the components of equity-mindedness is to learn how to be race-conscious in a critical sense, uh, how to be evidence-based, how to focus on the institution, and, and, and to be equity-advancing. So those are all things that are learned. And our work is about learning how to, in particular, how to be race conscious and systemically aware. And the way that we do that is through, um, through inquiry. So for instance, okay, so by race conscious, what I mean is, one is to pay attention to racial inequities, right? In educational, in educational experience and outcomes. But the only way you can pay attention to that if that is made part of the fabric of the institution you know, that it's, it's something that's looked at continuously, not just in the student equity committee, for example. And um, being race conscious also means that noticing who is in your class, in your classrooms, and what their engagement is, and um, being able to say, huh, I have 
I, I, I teach a calculus class or I teach you know, a developmental math class and I notice that after you know, the first couple of weeks, I am losing you know, Latino students or African American students. Why is that? It's being able to notice that and not treat it as a natural occurrence. So the student equity plan required by the chancellor's office requires you to provide success indicators on, in five areas, access, course completion, basic skills, degree completion, and transfer. And you're supposed to do that for several categories of students. Are you all familiar with the student equity plan? Kind of, yeah? <laughs> okay. So. To be uh, race conscious is to notice here that the transfer rate, for instance, for Hispanic students is uh, minus 4.3 percentage points for, for Latino students, right? And, uh, and so setting, you, it's important to set equity goals and uh, how you're going to close it by, you know, within a particular period of time. The student equity plan doesn't always require you to do these kinds of things, but we believe that this is what's, what's important. So is to be able to say here at Long Beach City College, Latino students are experiencing a transfer equity gap, which is true. Um, equity minded also means being able to um, to acknowledge that institutional practice that the low transfer rate might have something to do with the way that the institution functions or what you know how faculty work with students and so on so one of the ways in which you can actually ask how do we do transfer you know how do we do developmental education? How do we do the pathways? Is to use the methods of inquiry, but maybe taking, being able to do it from the perspective of students. How students experience the tutoring center. Remember, you know, they don't go to the tutoring center, I think it was. So have you ever thought of what it's like to go to the tutoring center here at Long Beach City College? Do you know where it is? Does it have a sign? When is it open? And who are the tutors? And how are the tutors trained to be you know, culturally responsive? So that's what I mean by a student lens. Um, I don't think that, is anybody here from Matt Lawrence's uh, group that he put together? Oh, Carlos. Uh, oh, yes, Carlos. <laughs> so um, one of the ways in which we ask those questions is by doing reviews of, for instance, syllabi. So the reason why I ask about Matt Lawrence's group is because that's what we're doing with them right now. Is look, the syllabus, I bet that many of you thought the syllabus is kind of a compliance document that we have to do, we follow some kind of format, and we just give it to the students, and we're almost sure that students never look at it. Um, but actually, I'm asking you to suspend judgment and to, to consider that the syllabus is a cultural artifact. It is an artifact that actually signals to the students and to others your, your teaching philosophy, but also it signals what you are going to do to help students be successful. It signals to students whether this is a class where I can succeed or this is a class where I'm definitely gonna fail given this syllabus. So, um, so that's one of the things that we do. How, the syllabus as an artifact of student success, as well as an artifact of professional pride on the part of faculty members. We have found that syllabi often are full of rules and about all of the things that you should not do rather than about the things that you could do and, uh, or that offer students you know, resources on how to be successful.
Um, so syllabi review, textbooks, uh, office, all of these are things, these are the things that we do, right? This is what we do, day in and day out as faculty members. All of these things can be studied. They can be studied from the perspective of equity and using protocols, not informally, but actually being serious about it. Here at Long Beach, several years ago when we worked, faculty went and to the transfer center and they studied, um, was, is Ruben Page your transfer? Is he still here? Yes, you know, one of my students wrote a winning dissertation uh, on the uh, reforms that Long Beach did long ago. I don't know if you're still doing them around transfer. But Ruben Page, we, we studied the transfer center and what went on. I remember that one of the members of uh, the team that you were on, um, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. <laughs> um, re I remember that she, and maybe it was you, I don't know, she put her hand on the catalogs for the four-year colleges and there was dust. And so that was one of the ways of knowing, you know, how often are they used. So what I'm advocating for is that you can treat the things that are familiar as unfamiliar to strangeify them in order to actually learn how they work and who do they work for. Um, so I already talked about that. And um, so these are the ways in which you can do inquiry into your own practices. Uh, is create a map of the practice. And you know, you might say create a map of the practice. So at Cal Lutheran, we created a map of the hiring practices and all of the documents that were attached to hiring practices in order to be able to understand it. So like for instance, hiring guidelines, um, the, the process for putting a, a job announcement in the Chronicle of Higher Education and so on. Here, for instance, I, I heard you talking about a strategic plan. Well, you could map out how a strategic plan gets done from the point of, you know, how a committee set up, you know, how often does it meet, how is it chair, what are the, what is the work of putting the strategic plan together and how might those processes you know, inadvertently limit or, 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 or expand, you know, your, your, your strategic plan. So, um, so here, are some of the, um, here are some of the examples of inquiry. Another one is observing the practice. So we have teams of faculty go to the transfer center and sit down and observe with a protocol. The same thing with the tutoring lab. And, um, and the same thing with classrooms. In the group that I mentioned earlier that Carlos is in, uh, that Matt Lawrence puts together, they're going to do classroom observations. They're pairing peer-to-peer -peer and using a protocol that we develop, they're going to observe each other's classrooms from an equity perspective. So, <clears throat> let me, um, I'm coming to the end. <laughs> So um, making race talk a routine at Long Beach Community College. So is this, like, do you think this is something that can be done? Do you think it's even worth doing? Yes. <laughs> so um, what I think would help making it a routine, a routine at LBCC is, um, to think about a new scheme of student success. Rather than thinking about what the students lack, thinking about ourselves as what do we lack. Uh, asking ourselves, you know, what is it that I might be doing that is not working and how could I do it differently? Uh, you know, we are creatures of habit, right? And, we, and, and so we, 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 we 
we get into particular practices and we, ne we don't interrogate them. I guess what I'm asking is, or I'm saying is that we need to interrogate, and I remind myself of that. You know, I remind myself every, I, I teach a course on qualitative methods. I remind myself to look at the previous year's student evaluations so that I don't make the same mistakes. Uh, you know, I remind myself to look at the readings to make sure that I'm up to date and so forth. I also do one more thing, and not that I'm an example, and by no means am I an exemplary instructor. I'm just as impatient as some of you might be. I also say, um, I also say of my doctoral students, they are doctoral students. You know, how could they not know how to write this? Um, but then I have to stop myself and think about what, you know, what am I supposed to do? What can I do to assist um, in, the, uh, in, in writing? So one of the things, office hours, right? Office hours is like the magic thing. I, um, I require all of, these are doctoral students, I require them all to spend one hour with me at least once during the semester. Not to talk about the course, but so that I can learn something about them. And Students who are in the doctoral program have said to me, you know, this is the first time that anybody has done this. And so now you're thinking, oh, okay, Estella, that's great for you. You know, you're, you're teaching at <laughs> graduate students and you have all of the luxury to have individual meetings with students and we're teaching, I don't know, 100 students a semester. But there are other ways in which you can get to know them. I actually developed a little, a, a, a kind of a, a question, a one-page questionnaire that faculty can give on the first day of class as a way of both signaling to students, I care about who you are, and also learning something about them. New data practices. Okay. One of the things that I find when we work with campuses is that, that they disaggregate their data for the student equity plan but not for other kinds of reports. So it is important to make the disaggregation of data throughout everything that an institution does. Um, for instance, it's important to disaggregate data by field. It is important to, um, it's important to disaggregate data by, I, I think you had a program here, was it the ambassadors, the student ambassadors? Do you still have it? It's important to look at who gets to be a student ambassador. And, and the reason for that is because the ambassadors is a social network. And the students who are in the ambassadors, really, they, they accrue advantages. Um, <clears throat> new department accountability, everything happens at the department level. It is important to look at your data at the course level. At Community College of Aurora, the chair of the math department disaggregated the data by course, by instructor, in terms of student outcomes. So you're thinking, I don't want that. I don't want to be you know, singled out for uh, not doing well with my students. Well, he was not doing well with his students, the chair, and so he used that as an example to talk to each one of his faculty members about their own data and how they could change their practices. And he has been tremendously successful. So you all do program review, right? Part of program review could be looking at course level data. Um, and what I already have talked about in terms of equity focused uh, inquiry. So learning to talk about race requires knowing the details of racial inequality generally and locally. What I mean by generally is Long Beach City College was not always a Hispanic serving institution, was it? You used to be at one time probably a predominantly white institution. In fact, the pictures on that other, on the, have you looked at the pictures on the other side in the hallway? I don't know, they, they must be going back to the 50s. So you were a different kind of college. It's important to know how did you become Hispanic serving? What happened here? What were the migration patterns? What brought Latinos here? It's really important to know that. Um, having measures of equity, I have already provided that. 
The other thing is that it's important, and this is particularly important for white faculty, that when you are in meetings and you know that there is, you know, like you, well, you, you want to say, well, those data are aggregated, right? Well, what about, how are Latinos doing? How are African Americans doing? It's important that you also raise those questions because typically, I know this from my own faculty meetings, you know, that race talk tends to be dampened by, because, or we always expect the person of color to be the one to raise the issue. So we all have to do it. And, um, and let, me, um, let me go to the last one. It's important, again, for white faculty to understand that race is not just about black, ethnicity is not just about Latino, that white is also an identity. It's, you know, it's, um, and it's an identity that provides certain advantages and that it, to use those advantages on behalf of others. And uh, otherwise, it's very, very difficult to bring about change. So I will stop with that, even though I had more stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and I even had other exercises. But um, I always um, underestimate uh, how long one speaks. And uh, I hope that this was useful to you. And uh, I wish you, uh, I congratulate you for being here on Flex, Happy Flex Day. And the one reason why I am not staying with you the rest of the day is because I have to go to my own faculty meeting at USC where attendance is taken. Um, <laughs> so, um, so thank you very much and I wish you the best. <laughs>